Good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, our latest informative webinar, Managing Gifting Strategies, How to Give What You Want, uh, to who you want, when you want, to whom you want. And we're very fortunate to have AQ alumni Bob Blyer, class of 1982, joining us today. He is founding partner of Montage Wealth Management. He is a, not only an Aquinas alum and in the Aquinas Hall of Fame, but an alumni of Richmond University and, and their Hall of Fame as well. Uh, so as we move through today's webinar, obviously this is being recorded and will be on demand on the Aquinas YouTube channel, AQ1902, um, afterwards. So if you miss part of it, or if you want to share it with uh, friends and family, you'll be able to do so. So uh, as we move through today's presentation, if you have questions, if you have comments, uh, please feel free to put them, uh, to raise your hand, put it in the chat box, Q&A. Uh, we will allow time at the end for uh, questions and answers, uh, as if you have a question, it's probably a question that other people have. Bob, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it looks like you're in your home office today, is that correct? I'm in my office office today. This is my man cave at, at work, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, fair enough, very good, very good. Uh, so we've asked you to, you know, we talked about this, obviously we have a lot, we get a lot of questions from our alumni who want to do something to help Aquinas. Uh, they want to make sure they're financially set for themselves, for their families, and include Aquinas in, in those plans. Uh, the one people, one group that they don't usually want to help is the government uh, through taxes. So that's going to be part of it as well. So uh, I'm going to hand this off to Bob. And like I said, if you have questions along the way, feel free to uh, raise your hands or put it in the chat box. And then, of course, we will, uh, of course, leave time at the end. So let me get your slide deck up here, Bob. Great. Is there anything I missed in your introduction that I should have said? Not at all. You did You did great. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it. So uh, well, welcome, everyone. I'm glad you could join us today. Um, you know, as an Aquinas graduate, our philosophy is tradition never graduates. So probably like many of you, I too like to get back to the institution and do whatever I can with my time, talent, and treasure. So welcome. I'm glad you joined us today. Um, I do want to let you know that this is kind of like a bird's eye view, uh, some some techniques, some strategies, some things to really think about uh, that may be of concern uh, to you. Uh, but in no way is it are we going to get deep in the weeds because I'm suggesting you talk to your your own personal tax attorneys or your tax advisors, as well as your financial planners or wealth advisors. And I'm open uh, and available for anyone who has questions after this webinar as well. So without further ado, we might as well get started. Um, so, so as Jay said, um, I think it's important um, with those who have charitable urges that you figure out, you know, what you want to give, when you want to give it, and to whom you want to get the assets. Um, there's many, many different things that we can do to give to charities. Number one is cash. Um, charities love cash, um, and that's just a really easy annual gift to give. Um, some other critical things are appreciated assets that are not in retirement plans. And the reason why that might be of interest to some of us um, is because non-IRA assets have what's called a cost basis in them. And if you realize any tax gain in your lifetime, you're going to pay ordinary income tax on it. But if you give or gift an appreciable asset to a charity as such as Aquinas, all of that tax becomes phantom and Aquinas gets to realize the full value of that asset and that gift while there's no tax due to the IRS. So you get the full deduction for that. So it might be a non-IRA investment, maybe some real estate or possibly your business interest because that's that's been very, very common in recent years as well. The other way to gift is through qualified retirement assets. Um, that would be IRAs, pension plans, anything that's driven by a retirement program. Um, and that's typically you can just kind of gift that through a beneficiary designations. Many of my clients name as a um, contingent beneficiary some of those charities that they have urges to give to. So you can do it simply through a beneficiary designation. The other way that we're gonna kind of get into in a little bit is through required minimum distributions. So for those of us who've uh, attained age 70 to 73, depending on when you reach that age, because the tax code is ever changing, um, you're able to give those required minimum distributions that the IRS wants you to take each and every year, you're able to gift those directly to a charity and not pay tax on it. So that's a really good, cool, creative way 
to give to, to uh, uh, Aquinas or charities as well. And then one thing that people really don't think much about is current life insurance policies. Um, so by simply naming uh, a charity of interest as a primary or contingent beneficiary, uh, that's a great way to give life insurance assets. And it also removes it from your taxable estate possibly. Um, and then obviously through wills and trust plannings and, get, and getting creative through um, um, documents in your will is a way to give assets away as well. So we, we want to determine first and foremost when we talk with clients is what do you want to give away first? So that's the first critical piece. And then we got to decide when you want to give it. Um, and that would be the next, next slide. So you, the nice thing about gifting is you get to kind of decide exactly when you want to make these distributions or contributions. So you can do it today. You can do something that's very, very current, which would possibly be a one-time gift. Um, and you'd obviously give it to the institution. You could create or, or commit to a series of gifts, gifts over time. Um, this is a very, very common technique because most people would rather give smaller amounts for a longer period of time than to maybe jeopardize their own income future. Um, so that's, that's a possibility as well. And then as we talked about earlier, through IRA required minimum distributions. Most people that I talk to aren't familiar with this technique, um, but we're gonna talk about it in a very, very short time, but that's a really great way that if you don't need any um, of your retirement income or you wanna just kind of defer some of it, this is a great way to make a distribution to a charity. Um, and pay absolutely no income tax on it. And the other thing is uh, maybe you're going to have some future triggering event um, that'll that'll kind of give you an opportunity to give some additional assets to a charity. And that might be when you retire. It might be when you sell a house or a special asset. Or if you yourself receive an inheritance, maybe you want to get creative in distributing some of that to charity as well. So um, some triggering event in the future could could kind of stir that up for you as well. And then lastly, obviously, is through legacy or date of death planning. So most of us, um, a prudent thing for most of us is to have some kind of a will um, so that your dispositive intent, meaning, you know, how you want to dispose of your assets and your property is, is really dictated and defined so that there are no questions by any courts. Um, so you can do that through legacy, uh, uh, date of death planning, by designating a beneficiary, or you can just do outright gifting through bequests, trust, and will planning, as we've mentioned before. So it's not only give what you want, but you can also determine when you want to give it. And then lastly, there are really three recipients of everything that we own. Um, and I typically find that this is the uh, this is the format that people would prefer to give their assets away to. Number one, to their family, charities are second, and obviously the IRS would be last on the list. And if we can cut them out entirely, that would be a really good uh, strategy and a good plan. So for your family, um, for those of you who don't know, um, we're allowed to give up to $17,000 per person to whomever we want annually without paying a gift tax. And that means that we don't have to pay tax and the recipient doesn't have to pay tax. For those of us who have a spouse, we're allowed to do what's called combined gifts. So that would be a $34,000 a year gift to whomever we want, as many people as we want each and every year with no gift tax to ourselves or to the recipient. You can also do it through beneficiary designations. So which means on life insurance and traditional IRAs or retirement plans, they all have a beneficiary choice. So you can give your family assets outright at death um, through those designations as well. And then obviously, Avoiding tax through your will and doing some trust planning is also really a good idea. So that's kind of some of the strategies to give to your family. Now, adding to a, a charity or, or a preferred charity or Aquinas, you can also do that through beneficiary designations, as I mentioned to you earlier, through an IRA or life insurance contract. You can simply name the charity as a beneficiary. You can name the charity as a beneficiary in your will through some trusts. Uh, or will planning. And then one of the things that's really taking notice right now for those people over age 70 and a half is what's called a Qualified Charitable Distribution or a QCD. And we will talk about that on the next slide. So charities love receiving assets. 
And if you think about it, if we ever receive an income from our IRA assets, it's 100% ordinary income taxable. So it's as though you earned it in a job or a wage. So if we don't need that asset and yet we're required to take it, and that's because the IRS wants their taxes due, we can defer that and give it away where we wouldn't pay tax on the distribution. And obviously the charity, in this case being Aquinas, would not pay any income taxes as well. So that's getting gaining popularity all over the country through these uh, QCDs. And then last, um, and, and quite frankly, whether we like it or not, the IRS is, is going to be some kind of a beneficiary for our state. Um, but what I encourage my clients to do, you know, you don't want to plan to fail, but if you fail to plan, you're actually making a choice to fail. So that's critical with everything that we do. Um, and you should be talking to your trusted advisors about that as well. Um, and then the IRS will also possibly receive some taxes due uh, through the probate process, not only New York State, but also there will be some federal death taxes that are available um, for the federal government that if we do proper planning, we can eliminate entirely. And I do want to point out one critical piece that's coming up in 2025 is that right now, each and every person has a $12 million uh, exemption um, in their estate before they're eligible to pay any kind of a death tax. That $12 million is being reduced to $5 million per person in 2025 through a sunset provision. So um, if you haven't thought through that yet, and if your estate is quite large, um, you need to think about planning prior to that sunset provision and taking advantage of the high, uh, the high state tax limits now. Uh, you can pass a lot of that money free. All right, next slide. So we talked about giving what you want, when you want, to who you want, and let's talk about how a charity can benefit from this, okay? Um, so obviously, they're going to gain incredible resources for their mission and their value proposition. Um, there's going to be no tax consequences to a charity for any gift that you do give. It'll help support their endowment and give financial assistance and financial aid and help them reach some, some goals in that regard. Um, improving and upgrading capabilities through its, its footprint, meaning its campus, its outreach, things of that nature. It'll add to budgeting or operational needs. Um, and for those of us who have an affinity for uh, Aquinas, it'll continue to keep perpetuity in place. Um, and uh, Aquinas also has some leg legacy desires as well. Um, and then we can gain resources for community outreach and obviously support to those they serve. So there's tremendous benefits for any kind of a gift that we would give to a charity, and in this case, Aquinas. So the next slide. So how do you benefit? Um, sure, we all we are all philanthropic. Um, Aquinas has kind of instilled that in most of us. Um, but there should be some benefits for us as well for a gift we give. Whether we want recognition or not, it's still really important to kind of uncover what some of these benefits could be for you and your families. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we're, we're going to meet some philanthropic goals. Uh, we're going to support commitments to our beliefs and personal values. Um, we can avoid tax on those assets that have already appreciated. Or if we give a current asset away that we know is going to appreciate substantially and create a tax liability for us, we can give that asset away today, knowing that the appreciation is going to have some phantom tax and no one will be, be responsible for that tax. Most importantly, um, we, we want to make sure that if we do give gifts, that we could possibly reduce not only today's tax burden, but possibly some future tax liability. Now, for those of you who have heard about this new SECURE Act 2.0, this is the whole new tax code that continually be, gets updated, and it's becoming more and more difficult to translate and interpret. Um, but if you have an, a, a desire for additional income, one of the new features of the SECURE Act 2.0 is it allows for us to give up to $50,000 from an IRA to a charity if it's considered what we call a split interest vehicle. And what that means is both the charity have to benefit and both you have to benefit as well. So there are two really that kind of stand out to me in this tax code. One is a charitable remainder trust. 
And basically it's a gift of cash or other property, but you must understand that this would be an irrevocable gift, meaning you sacrifice it, you can't get it back. So once the gift is given, it's irrevocable and you can't get it back. So the donor would receive an income stream from the trust for a term of years that would be determined by you and the charity or for the rest of your life to yourself or uh, a named beneficiary. Um, that's becoming more popular too, because as we see larger gifts being given to institutions, um, this, this split interest concept is, is gaining some popularity as well. And then the other, other possible split interest gift you could do is what's called a charitable gift annuity. And basically you make a donation to a charity. Um, they set the, the, the gift aside into a reserve account and they invest it uh, based on their uh, uh, investment policy statement from their uh, foundation or with their assets. Um, and based on your age at the time of the gift, you could receive either a fixed monthly or a quarterly income. Um, and it's gonna be supported by that investment account and you can typically get it for the rest of your life. So, so this the new SECURE Act has given us a little bit more of a feature to do some lump sum distributions out of IRAs. And if, that, if that's something you're interested in, then um, again, you should talk to some of your tax people, um, but I'm finding that that's gaining support as well. Okay, Jay, next. All right, so what I mentioned before is what is a qualified charitable distribution? The term qualified, uh, is referring to what we call qualified retirement assets, meaning it's already received some special tax treatment. You've, did, you've been able to deduct it or you've never paid tax on it yet. That's considered a qualified asset. Um, how can we do qualified charitable distributions from those, from those assets? Um, and quite simply, it's a tax-free distribution from an IRA sent directly to a qualified charitable organization. So this this is a way to get assets out of your IRA tax-free to, to a charity. Um, the catch to this technique is you must be 70 and a half uh, to qualify the, for the distribution. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if you do have these required minimum distributions that you, you're forced to receive, you don't need, but you're still paying income tax on, you can directly send that uh, RMD right to a charity and nobody pays tax on it. So that's a really great feature as well. Next slide, Jay. All right, here's some of the rules for a, a, a QCD. So again, you must be age 70 and a half at the time of your distribution. Um, it applies to all inherited IRAs and your own IRAs. And what I mean by an inherited IRA um, is if you have a spouse, and your spouse is a beneficiary of an IRA or a retirement plan, the law and the tax code now allows us to transfer that account right to your surviving spouse. And there are no withdrawal rules or regulations other than the RMD rules for that recipient. If you leave your IRA to a non-spouse, there are some completely new provisions available for how that non-spouse must take the income, must take the assets and how they must pay tax on it. And it's far more strict and stringent than if you left an IRA to your spouse. So this QCD provision does allow for you to give assets from an inherited IRA, meaning you got it from a spouse, an aunt, an uncle, someone other than um, um, someone I'm sorry, someone other than your spouse, from an aunt, an uncle, a friend, whatever it may be. Um, this allows you to defer all of that income as well and give it to a charity. So that, that's a, a really important point. Um, what a lot of people don't realize too is uh, you can't touch this asset. If you wanna give it to a charity and get a deduction for it and not pay any income tax on it, it must go directly from the current custodian, meaning who holds the assets now, to the charity directly. So the check must be made payable directly to the charity from your IRA. Uh, in addition to that, the donation is limited to $100,000 per person. Um, and it may be used to partially or fully satisfy your RMD requirements, as I just mentioned. So if you're getting money right now as an RMD and you really don't need it, but you're forced to pay tax, that's a great asset to give to Aquinas, a great asset. All right, so how would you make a qualified charitable distribution? 
first of all, um, you're gonna have to, we have to determine if you're eligible. Um, and again, the Secure Act 2.0 has kind of keeps raising the needle for that RMD age. Right now it's 72. Um, it's gonna go to 73 and it'll go all the way up to 75, I think in 2033. So the RMD age keeps growing and, and, and climbing. So you may not even, you may be in your 70s, but you may not be RMD eligible, which is a good thing if you don't need the money. But if you are required to take an RMD, um, we would have to determine your eligibility first. Uh, and I mentioned a few times, obviously your tax plan or your tax advisor or your accountant should be involved in any of these tax situations. Um, and most people that I, I, I run across rely heavily on their wealth advisor or their financial advisor to help them as well. If you are considering this kind of a gift, you should communicate with your charity of choice regarding your intent because they need to be actively involved in the process. Uh, there will be some paperwork required. There'll be some regulations that need to be followed. And it is a seamless, simple concept. Um, but we just have to make sure that it's done correctly. But, but communicating um, your intent with the charity of choice is a really critical thing. Um, it gains some excitement for the, for the charity um, and, you, and they gain an affinity for you, the relationship grows. So I think it's really, really good um, um, to let that charity know what's going on. And as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna work directly with the current custodian, meaning the, the, where the assets are held. Um, for instance, if the assets at, at Fidelity, your IRA is at Fidelity, we would work with Fidelity and Aquinas, and Aquinas and Fidelity would work on that transition to receive the assets. Um, and then we would just kind of initiate what's called a hands-free transfer. So this is common process um, for any advisor out there who would help you execute um, your intent for a qualified charitable distribution. But again, I think it's something that holds tremendous value, uh, holds a lot of water, and is it something that definitely should be considered um, if you are over age 70 and a half. All right, so how is it reported on your IRS Form 1099? So the 1099-R stands for rollover. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, you have to be completely aware of is when you're working with your, your accountant or your CPA, um, it is going to be reported on a 1099-R as a normal distribution for you. Or in the case, if you have that inherited IRA from a non-spouse, um, it'll be coded as a death distribution because there is no special coding for this. So you're going to need to consult your tax advisors to discuss the proper way to actually report it on your return because there is a way to report it properly. The 1099 won't reflect the gift. So again, as a complicated uh, uh, gifting strategy, yes, it is, um, but the benefits far outweigh a little bit of the legwork that needs to be done uh, and a little bit of the uh, the preparation that needs to be done to get it to get it completed. So um, I, I wanted to make that a, a critical point because your accountant would have to work uh, um, really closely with with you on how to report this on your return. All right, next slide, Jay. Okay, what's next? As I mentioned, um, you've got some, some split gift concepts for charitable annuities, charitable remainder trust. Um, you've got the opportunity now to gift assets from an IRA and not pay tax on it. So, so you need to kind of rally the troops with your trusted team. Um, talk with your tax planner, your attorney, your wealth advisor. Um, Communicate with the AQ Alumni Office. Jay is familiar with all of these concepts. AQ over the years has received gifts in every one of these forms and fashions. So it's something that we're very familiar with. Um, and if, if, if you see fit and you, you really want to get more information or get more in the weeds with kind of uh, uh, what an advisor can do to help their clients with this process, you can reach out to me directly um, for any additional guidance or direction. Uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to fellow alums um, who are philanthropic and have extreme charitable urges. So I would be available for you as well. Well, that, that's a lot of stuff, Bob. Thank you so much. So I've got, a, I've got a couple questions here. And then if anybody else has questions, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A. And we'll add those. Uh, one of the things I hear from people who, uh, there's a number of things, is that, Oh, 
I'm too young or I'm too old. Is it ever too early or too late to really start looking at any of these? You mentioned, that, for example, the required minimum distribution being, you know, I'm in my 70s. Well, I'm only 60. Or uh, is there, uh, for any of these, is it ever too soon or too late? It, it never is because if you think, if you think about accumulating assets throughout your lifetime, um, for those of us who, who tithe, who give 10% of our, our resources away each year, you're going to still have some other assets that may be appreciated, some that you haven't realized any tax gains on yet, some that you're avoiding getting rid of because of the tax consequences, or if you have business interests or real estate that you ultimately think would be better suited for a charity. Um, this kind of planning is done from the ages of 40 and up. And for those young people, I remember when I first started in the business and I was 25 years old, I took out a life insurance policy. Um, for Camp Good Days and Special Times, they're, they're, I'm chairman of the board at camp, and um, I made them the beneficiary, and I've been paying the premium for 35 years. So don't think that because you're young at heart or you're young at age or you don't have the resources to get creative and give as though you would like to, there are always ways to get creative and give to a charity. You, uh, you mentioned uh, in terms of resources, some people say, well, you know, I heard the number 5.4 million or this or that. Uh, oh, I don't have enough or I don't really have anything or my net worth. They look at their bank account and they think, OK, I've got this and that's my net worth. It, it, and I say this all the time. And you mentioned, you know, we do have, you know, we're knowledgeable here at Aquinas, but we're not licensed financial planners. We're not CPAs. But sometimes people say, well, I, I don't think I can use or benefit or afford to, to have an advisory committee, whether it's a, a tax person or an estate person, I always say you almost can't afford not to. What do you say to somebody that says, I just don't have, I'm, I'm not rich? Well, reach out to the, to the alumni network. There are so many people in our industry, um, financial services, uh, lawyers, tax accountants, tax planners. The, the Aquinas network and the Aquinas family is huge. So if you have an urge to figure out if you can do something, the best way to start is to reach out to some resource and have that frank conversation. You may be surprised at what your options are and what you can do and how you can leverage a small gift for something significant and that, that can magnify for the charity. So no one is has too few assets and no one has too many assets. So there, there, there's definitely something for everyone if you have that charitable urge. Uh, actually, this is a quick piece here that I, I mean, I know this, you mentioned about um, contacting the charity. We also have a lot of people, oh, I want to be anonymous. I don't want anyone to know, mm -hmm. uh, which is fine. One of the things I do have uh, one individual uh, from the, uh, I'll say the class 64, because initially he said, well, don't, I'm going to, I'm going to put you in our will. And I just want it to be anonymous unless you think it, it would be beneficial. I, and I would say, it may spur somebody else, maybe a classmate or somebody who knows you. Now he ended up staying anonymous, but it says anonymous class 64. So there was, we respected his wishes and didn't really push him. But at the same time, maybe somebody from his class says, oh, people from 64 are doing this and they can relate. So uh, I, I always say it's, it's, it's important. I, I, worst thing for me is when after someone passes, for example, we receive a gift and I have no idea what really their intent was. And, and a lot of times their intent was just to benefit the school and that's appreciated, right. but don't say thank you. And that's selfish on my part. So I, I, I thank you for bringing that up. In terms of um, some people who may be watching this, who are, you mentioned 40, 30, they're like, I'm a ways off and that's fine. But my parents are into their 70s now. Is there anything as, as a child should be able to look out or maybe talk to their parents about? Is that a different type of conversation? Yeah. Um, typically, if, if, if your folks have resources and, and you're part of that planning process, um, one of the things that's critical is to make sure that one of two things happen, that um, those assets pass either to the family or to a charity, because without planning, as I mentioned before, the IRS could take some of those assets. Mm -hmm. um, and there are people out there, and I run across them every day, who think, you know, they're fine, they're okay. Um, but quite frankly, um, there's there's certain things and techniques and tweaks they can do to their estate plan to make sure that, again, you give what you want to who you want, when you want. Um, and, the, and the best way to do that is to plan for it, plan way ahead for it. 
Yeah, I, I can't speak enough of that. Uh, I'll share personally. My parents, they just, they don't, they want their home. It's not a fancy home. It's not a big home. And they just, that's where they want to be forever. The fact is one of them may eventually have to go into assisted living while the other one wants to live there. We put that house in the trust a number of years ago. Uh, the advice we had gotten also from Aquinas alum, um, uh, Christian Valentino class in 91. I'll give him a plug because he's the <laughs> one that helped me sit down and said, well, you know, a lot of people are putting their homes in their kids' names for tax purposes or, or to protect it from if they have to go into assisted living. The only problem is that's still a liability for you if, if for whatever reason something happened where you had it's now your asset. Um, again, so I think you mentioned the, the trust earlier. There, it seems like people always say, well, trust sounds like something for wealthy people. Not not the case necessarily, right? It's not the case. Uh, the, the lifetime use trust is very, very popular as well. What you just mentioned, what you did with your family, we did it with my family. Mm -hmm. Um, it allows the your, your folks or your parents or your loved ones to stay engaged in the house, receive all the tax benefits, the star benefits, and so forth and so mm -hmm. on. But it begins the clock from which it is removed from your estate for long-term care or assisted care planning. Um, so it's it's really a wise thing to do, especially if you know that's the, the final home of your folks. They're going to stay there. They're going to die there. That's their home. Um that that lifetime use provision is 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 quite frankly a really good practice to protect the house from from ever getting away from the family. Uh, here, so here's a great question for required minimum distribution again from a, a fund. Do I have to gift it all if I'm required to take it? I'm going to throw. I'm making up a number here. If I'm required to take twenty thousand dollars from this account this year, do I have to give all twenty to a charity? Can I take ten, give ten, etc.? Great question. Um, we, we have dozens of clients who we do this with every year. Um, they'll figure out what their gifting needs or their charitable urges are. For instance, if they have a $10,000 required distribution, maybe they'll give $5,000 to charity. They'll elect to retain $5,000. And, and one of two things can happen. We, you know, we do the direct charitable gift to the charity. They get their money. And then the, the, with the remainder mint can either be a lump sum distribution to you based on your requirement or you can do it monthly so that you fulfill that RMD requirement. You don't have to give it all. You can give a little bit to a number of charities. You can give it all to charities. You can give a small piece and keep most. You, I mean, it's very, very flexible. Um, there's no requirements for how much you can or can't do. Yeah, that's, that, that's great. Hey, and when I first came in this years and years ago, I thought, oh, it was all or nothing. And I've, I've come to find out this. That is a great question. You mentioned um, the one thing about gifting annually, uh, maybe to kids, the, the amounts that were, were out there for single or married and things of that nature. Uh, real quickly, in terms of some people file separately or together, things like that, is it a big difference? How, how, how much would you say is important that, you know what, if it's more difficult, easier if you're married, what's the differences really for any of this stuff uh, for single versus married? It's, it's really no different because there, the law is designed to, to, like, to help you take advantage, the tax code is designed to help you take advantage of all of the exemptions that are available. So for instance, right now, the individual exemption that every one of us have to pass to uh, a family or to give a legacy without any death taxes is $12 million. So let's use this as an example. I have a, a son that I want to give $50,000 to, right? I'm only allowed to give 17 so that no one pays tax. So the remaining 33,000, I have to put on my tax return to come, ag to come against the 12 million exemption I currently have. So there's still no taxes. You just have to account for it properly if it's over that annual gift tax exclusion amount. And that's critical because don't be don't be scared or skewed by that limit of seventeen or thirty four thousand. You could give a hundred thousand. We just have to account for it properly on your estate tax return, so that if you get audited at death, it doesn't get dragged back in and and they say it wasn't a qualified gift. Okay. Uh, another question we have here is, in terms of um, you mentioned a little bit about the laws changing all the time. How often should we be revisiting this? Should this be annually, monthly, quarterly, or every five years, or based on events? How, how often should these things be revisited? If you're getting into a systematic charitable giving program, you should review it each year. 
Um, and the reason for that is, you know, going through the Secure Act 2.0, which is this brand new tax code that overwhelmed the industry, uh, both the accounting industry and the financial services industry, limits, catch-up provisions, opportunities, deductions, each and every year, things are, are kind of stepped and, and, and escalated. So it's going to be an ever-changing, ever-changing tax code. So it's not, in my opinion, it's never going to be a one and done. If you're going to do something like this um, and, you, and, you're, and, and it's something that's pure and dear to your heart that you're going to try and consistently do, it definitely needs to be revisited every year, um, not only for yourself, uh, but for your tax return. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to put this back out there. If there's any other questions or anything else you want to have, to, now's the time to do it. Um, otherwise I will tell you, um, get in touch with Bob. He knows what he's doing. There's no doubt about it. And again, you know, a lot of people I think are intimidated, uh, sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I can say, don't be, it's, it's better to ask the question than not. So yeah, you're going you, what we find too, Jay is you're right. Uh, don't hesitate to ask because you'll, you'll be surprised at the answer. Uh, there's, there's something that you can do. There always is. It's just it's just about degree. Um, so don't shy away from the fact that if you don't have a lot of assets, you think you're not eligible for a gifting program. Um, there are people that I work with now, uh, a lot of 20-year-olds, like clients, children, who start gifting programs now in small amounts, whether it's a monthly program or an annual commitment. So um, yeah, never, never discount where you are at the stage in life you're in because there's something available and something that everyone's eligible to do. Okay. Uh, Bob, again, thank you so much. This is great information. And I always say when I talk to people, whether it's about planned gifts or yearly gifts or whatever it is, you know, hopefully these get you thinking in terms of planning, not only for giving, but your future for your family, because uh, as, as you point out with the first three, you know, there's families, charities and, and Uncle Sam. Mm -hmm. And I, I, when I talk to people, some people say, I want to, I'm going to give most of my wealth or most of my money to my family. And there's going to be something for Aquinas to small, or sometimes it's vice versa that, Hey, either I don't have a big family or my kids are fine. Um, but nobody comes to me and says, I want the state or the federal government to get most yeah, of it. Right. Nobody has them on the top of the list. And I think, You're right. They shouldn't and, be, they get yeah. enough every, they get enough out of our pocket every year. They shouldn't be. <laughs> so I tell people all the time, at the very least talk to someone. So that is not, by you know un, undecided right. by you to, to give to the government so in closing right. i would say if you have questions that come through if uh this will be up on our youtube channel uh shortly and uh, we'll be putting this out on our social media platforms to where you can watch this on demand please feel free to share that feel free to to, to call bob or myself if you have questions specifically about aquinas um bob thank you so much um sure. And uh, again, reach out, find out what you can do, and uh, we'll see you at our next webinar. Thank you, Jay. Take care.